Section 8.1 mostly is fundamentals of linear algebra because if we're going to solve systems of differential equations, this is a far, far more efficient way of doing it to use matrices and things. So this first page is a lot of just matrix properties for the most part, where generally this is how one would be set up, where the A11 and the A12, these are all just different entries in the matrix, um, where this, if you look at this last term down here in the lower right, um, where the subscripts are M and N, so it's saying it's in the mth row in the nth column, so that's an M by N matrix, so M rows, N columns. Uh, that's about as general as I can make. Where then the A sub I J's, so that would be like the A sub two one, the A sub three two and so forth. That would be the term of the entry in the I row in the Jth column. So like A three two, that's in the third row and it's in the second column, right? Or A two one is in the second row and the first column. A lot of what we're going to have, but not everything, will be square matrices, where a square matrix is one where the number of rows and the number of columns are the same. So, like, that's a two by two, because you've got two rows, two columns, right? And you can have a three by three and a four by four and five by five and so forth as well. And then a vector is a matrix that would only have one column or only have one row. We're going to have these because that's how um, like the original functions like X and Y would be arranged as a vector when, when we start to see those. Or when we have the derivatives, like, like all the first derivatives, you can make a vector out of that and we'll see that too. Um, mostly we're going to have column vectors, but you could also have row vectors, right? I mean, this right here, it's got one row, so you know, by definition, that is a vector, but usually they look like this. Usually they're in columns. Then addition, you can only add matrices if they're the same size. So same number of rows and same number of columns, like how here you can add a couple of two by twos together. And the addition works the way that you would think it would work, where then you just add their respective entries. So um, like first row, first column, here's a five, first row, first column, here's a three, and then you add those together, right? And then negative two plus zero, that's right there. Seven plus negative two is right there, right? So um, you would add the respective entries together from the two matrices, but addition and subtraction, I suppose, would only work if the matrices are the exact same size. Last thing on this page is scalar multiplication. So if you have a scalar, so that's what that lambda is supposed to be. So like if that lambda is like a four or an eight or something, then if you multiply a scalar by the matrix, you just multiply that scalar by every entry. So here I said, well, if it's a four and you're going to multiply it by this matrix A that's up here, you just multiply four by every entry in the matrix. So four times five, four times seven and so forth. Multiplying two matrices together, however, that's a little more complicated than multiplying by a scalar. So if we've got two matrices, and notice that for A, the number of columns is the same as the number of rows in B, you actually need that in order to get this to work. Because the way that you do it, and I guess this would be the formal notation definition here, um, basically what you do is, uh, like we're gonna multiply A and B. In order to get the first entry, it's first row of A times first column of B. And then the entry that's, I guess, to its right, that'll be the one in the upper right, it would be the first row of A times the second column of B. And you can see them down here, right? This first entry, so first row, first column, it's the first row of A times the second column of B going entry by entry. So like the first entry here is a five, the first entry in this column is a three, so five times three. Second entry in this row is a seven. Second entry in this column is a zero. So there's the seven times zero. Then to go over to this one, it's the first row times the second column. So five times negative two, right? First entry in this row, first entry in this column. That's right there. And then second entry in this row is a seven. Second entry in this column is a negative three. So seven times negative three. This one down here, um, so what ends up being 
um, what's in the second row, first column, you use the second row here and then the first column over here. So negative two times three, so right, first entry in this row, first entry in this column, and then three times zero, which is right there, is second entry in this row times the second entry in this column. And then for this one, which would end up being in the product, the entry that's in the second row and second column, you use the second row here and you use the second column there. So you get negative two times negative two plus three times negative three. And then these, you can simplify all of them, right? This one, it's 15 plus zero, so it's 15. That one's negative 10 minus 21, so it's negative 31. That one's a negative six, and then that one ends up being negative five. So the multiplying of two matrices, if you're not used to it, that's different. And this is one of those things where once you get used to it, you know what to do, but at first it looks really, really weird. And I'm aware of that, but you know, if it takes a little bit of time just to be like, wait, what, what exactly is going on here? That's totally normal. At first, this is a weird looking thing. Then the other example, and this will be a thing that we're gonna have to do a lot, where you have to multiply a matrix by a vector. So X is just a vector, right? It's a column vector where you just have X1 and X2. We're gonna multiply matrix A by that. So then what you end up with only ends up having two entries. It ends up being a vector itself because ultimately this has got two rows, but then this has one column. So then it ends up being a two by one, which is a column vector when you multiply it out. And you can think of it as well, if you multiply five times X1, seven times X2, then that goes on the top. Then you go to the next row then it would be negative two times x1 um, plus three times x2. And here that would be second row first column, right? So it's just, you get two things that are in the first column. So really this is just a, a vector. It's just a column vector. Um, and that is actually a thing that we end up having to do quite a bit. A note about multiplication. One thing is that multiplication does not commute. So if you use the matrices above and you get B times A instead of A times B, you're going to have something different, right? You end up here for B times A, which is not what we had at all for A times B. And then the other thing is that for matrix multiplication to work, the number of columns in the first matrix has to match up with the number of rows in the second. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then you can't multiply them together. Then the other thing, in this you need to get inverses, um, what an identity matrix is. So an identity matrix is a square matrix with ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So for a two by two, it's like that, right? You got ones on the diagonal, you get zeros in those other two spots. For a three by three, you'd have ones on the diagonal and then zeros down here and zeros up here. And for any matrix, when you multiply that matrix A, right, some arbitrary matrix A by the identity matrix in either order, so either I times A or A times I, either way you should get A back, right? So the identity matrix, it's kind of like multiplying by one, right? If you were just, you know, multiplying numbers, like individual numbers, it, it works like that. It works exactly like that. The next thing is differentiation and integration. And it seems like these might be more intense or more complicated just because matrix multiplication seemed kind of unusual. But these are actually straightforward, as it turns out. Because if you want to take the derivative of a matrix, then you just take the derivative of every element in the matrix. So like if this is A and you want DA DX, well, the derivative of 5X is 5, derivative of negative 2 is 0, derivative of sine X is cosine X, and the derivative of 1 over X is negative 1 over X squared. That's it, right? It's just all the individual derivatives. And then integrating is kind of the same way. So if you wanted to integrate the matrix A, you just integrate the individual elements and that should do it, right? So you integrate 5x, you get 5 halves x squared. You integrate sine x, you get negative cosine x and so forth, negative 2x and then natural log of the absolute value of x. So those actually end up being kind of what you would think, uh, even though the multiplication if you're not used to it, that's a little weird at first. The next thing is how to get the inverse of a matrix. This involves the identity matrix. So what you need 
if you're trying to find an inverse, right? So that would be the notation for A inverse. And that would be the matrix such that if you multiplied A and A inverse together in either order, you should get the identity matrix back out. So the way that you do it is that you start with A, you augment it with the identity matrix, and then you do a bunch of row operations so you get the identity matrix on the left. Because then if you have that on the left, then the thing that's on the right will be A inverse. So that's actually how you end up going through this. And this is probably a lot easier to see with a matrix that actually has some numbers in it. So if that's matrix C, so three, negative one, six, two. So there's C and I've got it augmented with I, right? Because for a two by two, that's the identity matrix. And then what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna do a bunch of row operations to where I eventually get I over here. And then the thing that's left on the right, that'll be the inverse. So if I'm gonna to try to get I on the left, the first thing is I need a one is that first element in the matrix. So first row, first column, I need a one. So I said, all right, I'm gonna multiply the first row by one third, and then now that's the new first row. So that's what happens, right? All I did was divide these numbers by three, right? Three over three will give you that one like you want, but then you also have to divide the negative one by three, and you gotta divide that one by three. And I guess you divide that zero by three as well, but that doesn't really do anything. Okay, well then once you get there, you say, well, if we have a one here, then to get the identity matrix to the left of the dotted line, we need a zero where that six is. So the row operation that I did is I said, if I multiplied that first row by negative six and then added it to the second row, then we'd end up with negative six plus six equals zero in the lower left, which is kind of what we're aiming for here. So that'll be the new second row, negative six times the first row plus the second row that's here right now. And if we do that, you do get a zero there, because that'll be negative six plus six. Here you'd have negative six times negative one third, which is two, right? And then plus that two, so two plus two will give you four. Then here to get that negative two, it's negative six times that one third, which is negative two, but then plus zero. So negative two plus zero, that's negative two. And then the last one, negative six times zero, plus one, well that's just zero plus one, so that's one. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So we got the first column of the identity matrix, and then the next thing you go, well, we got a four here, it would be better if that was a one, because that's what's actually in the identity matrix. So we're just gonna multiply that second row by one fourth, right? Then we'll end up with a one in that position. So multiplying four by one fourth, you get one, Negative two by one fourth, you get negative one half, and then one by one fourth, you get one fourth. Almost done. The only thing that we don't have is right where that negative one third is up there, we need that to be a zero. So we just have to multiply the second row by something that then we can add to the first row and get a zero right there. And it looks like the thing that we're gonna want is one third, right? Because one third minus one third would give you zero. So that's what I did over here. I said if we have one third times R2, That'll take care of that, because one third times one is one third, and then minus one third would be zero. So one third R2 plus R1, that'll be the new R1. So zero times one third is zero, plus one will give you a one right there, so that doesn't really change. One times one third minus one third, that's zero. Then going over here, negative one half times one third is negative one sixth. Negative one sixth plus one third is positive one sixth, which is right there. And then here, one fourth times one third is one twelfth. Add that to zero, you get one twelfth. And that does it, because look at what we've got here. We've got identity matrix on the left, and then we've got other stuff on the right, and that other stuff is gonna be the inverse. So that means that C inverse is one sixth, one twelfth, negative one half, one fourth. So that's how you get the inverse. That can be a labor intensive process if you have to do a lot of row operations, but that's the way that you do it. The first thing on the next page is how to get the determinant of a matrix. So a two by two determinant is easy. You just figure out the diagonals and you take the difference. But for anything bigger, and I think we're really only gonna have to deal with three by threes, there are a couple of ways to do it. You can do this which I think is the more conventional one. And if, if you've had Calc 3 or if you're taking Calc 3, 
this looks a whole lot like what you do to get a cross product and it's basically that exact same thing um it's just there's no i j and k on the top right but you can do it this way where it you kind of cycle through the entries in the first row and then you would get the that entry multiplied by the determinant of what's in the remaining rows and columns. So like this first part here where I have the one multiplied by this two by two determinant, I'm taking this one in the upper left corner. So first row, first column, and then it's the determinant of what's left if you blocked out that row entirely and that column entirely. So it's these four entries right here. So two, one, two, one, and that's how that ends up over here. The next thing is we got a two up here and then you say, okay, well, if we if we block out that row that the two is in, we block out this column that's all twos, you'd have one, one, negative, or one, one, three, one, right? So there's one, one, three, one. There's a negative out front. How come there's a negative? It's because in order to do it that way, you're actually going out of order. The way it's supposed to work, if you block out the row and block out the column, is you'd have these two, the one, one, and then it would wrap to the other side, and you'd have one, three. So it would be one, one here and one, three there. And if you do it that way, this is a plus. But the, the way to do it usually to make this more accessible is just instead of doing it that way, to say, well, if you subtract, then one, one, three, one show up in kind of the order they're in originally in the matrix. And usually that's just easier to follow. So you can do it this way, or you can do it as plus two times the determinant of one, 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 three. And that would give you the same thing. And then the last one, we've got a three in the third column in that first row. So you block out that column, you block out that row, you'd be left with one, two, three, two, which is right there. So if you do it that way, then you have some two by two determinants to get, but they're easy, right? This first one's two minus two. This one, the second one is one minus three. Third one is two minus six. And then that's not too bad to simplify. You end up with negative eight. That's one way of doing it. The other way to do it, which this is actually what I prefer, because this makes it easier if you go above a three by three, like if you have a four by four or something, if you augment the matrix with itself, then you can basically just use the diagonals that spring out of each of the entries in the first row. So either on this side or on this side. So that's why I have these red diagonals in here, because then basically what you do is that the, the diagonals that go left to right, so like these first three right here, those you would add, and then the three that go right to left that are coming out of that first row of the augmented matrix. So like if you think of this as being A and then this as being like its clone or its copy, then the ones that come out of the clone or the copy, you subtract them. But they're also the ones that direction-wise are oriented the opposite way. So what I got over here, the way that I got these numbers, so this two right here, it's one times two times one. It's that first diagonal. The second diagonal going in the same direction is two times one times three, which is six. Then the third diagonal is three times one times two, which is also six. And then if you go the other way, you subtract those. So one times one times two, that's two, so we're gonna subtract two. Then two times one times one, we're gonna subtract another two. Three times two times three is 18, so we're gonna subtract an 18. And then if you simplify this down, you get negative eight. So the same thing that you get there. So either way is gonna work. I admittedly feel more comfortable doing it the second way, but they both work. Whichever one looks like it's easier, I guess do that one. The next thing is how to write a system of linear equations in matrix form. The non-homogeneous versions got an extra piece tacked onto the end if you compare these two expressions right here. But we'll deal with that when we get to example number two. That actually doesn't make things extra crazy or anything. The main idea is that when you do it, you have these x and x prime vectors where like x prime would be like all the first derivatives. So like if x is, you know, uh, a column vector where you've got x1, x2, x3, let's say, then x prime would be a column vector where you have x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime. So the x and the x prime, those are just column vectors. Um, a is gonna be a matrix, and then f, that's gonna be a vector, or you can break it up into multiple vectors, and we'll see that when we get to example number two. But with this first example, where we've got these two 
equations right here. Right? We've got the, these two differential equations where we can say, okay, on the two left sides, we got the two first derivatives. So I'm gonna say for that first column vector that I've just got x prime, y prime, because I think it's easier to write it with the prime notation here rather than the Leibniz notation. But then what's on the right, um, basically you just have to rewrite this as matrix multiplication. So like in order to get 4x minus 2y, it's four times x minus two times y, right? And then in order to get this, it's three times x plus 10 times y. So if you rewrite it this way, where you have this first row, which would be four, and then the, then the negative two, if you multiply that by this column, you would get four x minus two y back out. And then you do the same thing down here. You say, well, if we had three, then 10, we'd get this back out. So you just have to rewrite this right side as though it's matrix multiplication, and then the x and x prime, like the big X and big X prime, the thing that's a little bit awkward with using x here is that it, you end up having x's that are two different things because like then there's also an x here. Um, but that's what our book uses and that is the conventional notation. So we're gonna stick with it, I suppose. That's why I tried to make this x super bold and big to differentiate it from that one to say, you know, this big bold x, that's the vector. And then this big bold x prime is its derivative because big bold x is the column vector x, y. So then big bold x prime is the column vector x prime, y prime. And so there's what you end up with writing this in matrix form. Number two is one that's non-homogeneous because we've got a one here, we've got a minus two t, we've got a three t squared. So at first you end up just kind of throwing that on the end and you say, okay, well, for the matrix multiplication part, we just need the terms that involve x, y, and z. So in order to get that first equation, you need three times x, negative one times y, negative five times z, right? And then the next one, one, seven, and eight, and then 12, negative nine, and then there's no z term here, so then that's just gonna be a zero. So here the big X is the column vector x, y, z, and then the big X prime is the column vector X prime, Y prime, Z prime. And then, well, what do you do with this other stuff? Well, you just kind of throw that into a separate vect vector in the end. So that's the thing that's called F up above, where you'd have one negative two T and then three T squared. You could also write it this way. So I guess if you're inclined toward linear algebra, maybe you'd do it like this, where you'd say, well, these are, different powers of t, right? t to the zero, t to the first, t to the second. So we could also write that with three separate vectors where they're separated out based on the powers of t, where then for the constant, you just have this vector. Then for the t, you would just have that negative two in the second entry of that vector. And then for the t squared, you have the three in the third entry and zeros up above it. And that's an alternate way of writing the same thing. In a way, the second version is more thorough. It's also longer. Um, and just for expressing it this way, I don't know if you get anything extra. Um, but I guess this is one of those things where if you've seen a bunch of linear algebra before, you might be inclined to write it like this. I write it like that, but admittedly, this is more compressed and efficient up here. Next thing is going backwards. So what if you had matrix notation, but you wanted to write that system without matrices. We can kind of jump right to it, I think, because then if you think the big X is the column vector X, Y, like little X, little Y, and then the big X prime is the column vector X prime, Y prime. So then you say, well then, okay, in the first row, you'd have X prime equals, and if you did the multiplication out here, it would be eight times little X minus one times Y, which is right there. And then, just adding in these extra pieces from having a non-homogeneous system, you have one times e to the t, which is just e to the t, plus negative one times t, which would be minus t. So there's the first row. Then the second row, you'd start with y prime. You do the matrix multiplication here, that's gonna be two times little x plus seven times y, and there's that down there. And then for the non-homogeneous stuff at the end, second row, you got a two, so two e to the t, right there, and then plus three halves times t, there's the, the three halves t. And there's the system written without matrices. And then something else where you could end up using matrices is verifying a solution. 
So like if you wanted to verify that X, which is written this way in matrix notation, is a solution of this system here. So, all right, well, if that's what big X is, then that's saying little x, little y, if you wanted to write it as a column vector, is equal to this vector here, the two negative three times e to the t. Well, you could multiply that out and say little x would be two times e to the t and little y is negative three times e to the t. That's gonna be easier for getting things like derivatives, even though here the derivatives are really easy, right? Because it's just taking the derivative of e to the t. So you don't really get anything a whole lot different, but in general, that probably does help a little. All right, so then to see and verify that that's a solution, I just said, you know, go ahead and sub in and multiply it out. So there's the matrix times big X, but then big X would be the column vector, little x, little y. You can do matrix multiplication there, right? So first row times that one column would be 4x plus 2y. Second row times this one column is negative 3x minus y. But then we know what x and y are because they're defined up here, that x is 2e to the t and then y is negative 3e to the t. So you can sub those in, which is what I did here. And then if you simplify, I guess there's an intermediate step and you end up here. So you get 2e to the t in the first entry, negative 3e to the t in the second entry. But those are x prime and y prime. So that is big X prime, right? That's that vector, it's that derivative vector. So yeah, it works, right? When we subbed in um, 2e to the t and negative 3e to the t for x and y, we did get big X prime out. So yeah, um, that X right there, it is a solution of this system. Checking to see if you have a fundamental set of solutions is something that we had to do before and you basically do it the same way, it's just that now it's applied to when you have vectors or when you have a system of equations. So when we did this before, it was that you have a fundamental set of solutions if the Ronskian is not always zero. And it's still that idea, right? There's the W for Ronskian, and then the big X1, big X2 are just the different vectors. So the different solution vectors. And so then we have to get the determinant of those vectors where the vectors are the columns. So like this first column is supposed to be big X1, the second column is supposed to be big X2, the nth column is supposed to be big Xn, right? So it's just, you just throw the vectors in here. And as long as you don't get zero, then you've got a fundamental set of solutions, um, which is what happens when they're linearly independent. So like if we were taking a linear algebra class right now, instead of a differential equations one, if we were just looking for linear independence of vectors, this is a way that you can get that too. Um, it's the exact same process. But having linearly independent solutions, um, that would happen if and only if you've got a fundamental set, um, if you've got n solutions to a system of n equations. Um, right, so like if you have three equations and you've got three solutions and they're linearly independent, then you've got a fundamental set, that kind of thing. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So with this example, we've got our three solution vectors, right? There's big X1, big X2, big X3, and we wanna see if they form a fundamental set of solutions. All right, so what I said was in order to get that Ronskian, you gotta get the determinant where the vectors are just in separate columns. So we got three vectors, we should have three columns, we just have to multiply the vectors out. So like this big X1, rather than writing it this way, I would just multiply the e to the t through here, where basically you just distribute it to the different elements of that vector. And that's what's right here. So two e to the t, two e to the t, e to the t, right? That's big X1 right here multiplied out. Then you multiply out big X2, so that's negative two e to the three t, zero e to the three t, which was just zero, and then one e to the three t, right? Then big X3, multiply that one out, two e to the five t, negative two e to the five t, and e to the five t. I did the determinant the way that I don't usually do it, but I figured that would be easier to handle here. So first element in the first row is two e to the t, so I've got that times the determinant of these four entries, right? Because if I'm up here, you're gonna block out this first column and you're gonna block out the top row. So it's just these four and then that's what's right there. Then it would be minus the second entry in the first row times the determinant of that 
I guess those two uh, entries right there in the first column and then those two in the second column. But since it's minus a minus, that's a plus. So plus two e to the three t. And then if you look at what I've got here, it's these two entries on the left, then these two entries on the right. And then plus two e to the five t coming from that last entry of the first row times what you get as a determinant when you block out this row and you block out this column. So it's these four entries right here, two e to the t, zero e to the t, and e to the three t. All right, so then we have two e to the t times this determinant, which would be zero plus two e to the eight t, right? Because zero times e to the five t will be zero. And then minus negative two e to the five t times e to the three t. And you can add the exponents together since you've got the same base. So that's where that eight T is coming from. Then with this one, take that determinant. First diagonal, you're gonna get two E to the six T. And then that's gonna be minus negative two E to the five T times E to the T. So it ends up being plus another two E to the six T. And then the last one, you'd have two E to the T times E to the three T, which is two E to the four T and then minus zero E to the T, which is just zero. All right, simplifying, everything has an e to the 9t in it, right? So there it's just two times two is four, and then you can add the exponents there. Here you'd have four e to the 6t times two e to the 3t, you get that, and then four e to the 9t in the end. Add those together, you get 16 e to the 9t, which is not always zero. And in fact, it's never zero right? Um, because what do you raise e to in order to get zero? That doesn't exist. So the Ronskian is not equal to zero. And since that happens, those three vectors form a fundamental set of solutions for some system of three equations, right? We don't know what the system is, but they would form a fundamental set for some system of three equations.